Hello, everyone. It's so good to be with you here again this evening. And, uh, you know, I'm real excited about the word that I have on my heart this evening to, uh, to share with you. And, uh, you know, there are, some, there are some things that happen to us in life that at the time that it happens, it may not, it may not make a lot of sense. I'm sure you can look back, many of you, and, and see where, where maybe, you know, there were some turns. And at the time, there was disappointment. There might have been struggles. There might have been sadness, loss. But once you're beyond that, you look back and see that those were critical turning points. Things that took place, even in the midst of discomfort and being alarmed, brought you to the place where you are now. And you realize that had those events not happened, you might very well be somewhere different. There are also events that happen that have actual greater meaning. And sometimes people who are involved in those events see that more clearly than those around them. And as a result, they can become greatly misunderstood. Jesus was one of those people. He was one who understood clearly what he was going to face in life. He was going to face the cross. And he um, knew that way ahead of time. I never will forget reading a passage by Jonathan Edwards where he said that Jesus knew up front. He was not hoodwinked. He was not tricked. He was not brought to the point and say, oh, you know, here you go. But he knew way ahead of time that he was going to have to die the death that he died. He knew it when the woman who had the issue of blood was healed, when the blind eyes were opened, when the crippled and the lame walked, and when he told the man to stretch out his arm that was withered and it became whole. He knew the price that he would have to pay, that would have to be paid for humanity to be healed, not just in body, but also in their souls. And I want to start at a point that might be alarming to you, where there was a conversation about, well, just what was going to happen with him. Jesus, in the book of John uh, I'm sorry, I'm in the book of Luke, beginning in the ninth verse, uh, ninth chapter, 27th verse. Jesus says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, he's speaking prophetically here about something that's going to happen in a few, in, in a few days. So it says right after he said this, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. This is that kingdom that he was referring to. And these are those ones who, will, who are seeing this kingdom. And it says, behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory. Now, take a look at this. Here's Moses and Elijah, and they're there transfigured. And this is years beyond their, their lifetime. And so uh, we understand how Elijah could get there. Uh, he was translated. Elijah was the prophet who was caught up in a whirlwind and brought up into heaven. But Moses was a different story. Moses died. Not only did Moses die, but God buried him. Now, if God buries someone, they're in a grave and they're, you know, they're dead. And yet here Moses is standing here on the Mount of Transfiguration, as it were, raised from the dead. And so we also have, and so we have evidence from the book of Jude where there was a conflict between the angel of the Lord and, and between uh, Satan over the body of Moses. And why would there be such a debate? Well, 
There's no blood on the altar. There's no removal of sin that has been done. The sacrifice of the lamb has not been there. Man's physical body must see corruption. You cannot raise someone like that uh, from, from, from the dead under the old covenant. And yet, here, here, here he is standing there. Now, it says that Moses and Elijah were talking with him, and they spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So here they are now, standing there in that kingdom that can only be purchased by the blood and not purchased for him, not be accomplished for him, but be accomplished for us to enter into the kingdom. He needed no blood to enter into glory. We did. And he was being told what it was going to take for Moses to be standing in front of him. You know, it's almost, and so God was taking something prior to Time passing where blood could catch up with the promise. Reality, prophetic fulfillment could catch up with the promise itself. But God didn't have to wait for prophetic fulfillment to catch up with what he said. When he says something, he can cash in on it at the moment. It's almost like if someone has a seed in their hand and God shows up and he's eating an apple and and the, and the person with the seed said, Lord, where'd you get that apple? He says, I got it out of the tree that grew from the seed that's in your hand right now. God is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end and all things in between. And so, uh, and so here we see this incredible conversation about what was to be accomplished, what he was about to accomplish how can you accomplish a crucifixion? Through surrender. He was going to surrender to the plan of the Father. You see, here is the greater meaning that's attached. Yeah, it looks like a cross of destruction, and it's certainly a place of suffering. It's not a place that Jesus wants to go to, but he's going to because he sees he sees clearly, here's Moses, how's he going to get there if I don't do it? And now take a look at the book of Luke, again, down in the 43rd verse. So Jesus leaves the Mount of Transfiguration, having a conversation about his, how, what's going to happen in Jerusalem, and now he foretells his death here. And it says, uh, but while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, verse 44, let these words sink into your ears. The son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. So now Jesus is having the same conversation with his disciples that he had with Moses and Elijah. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed for them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Now, why would, why would God say something like this and them not be able to comprehend it or to perceive it? It's an easy, simple question to, to ask and to answer. Have you ever had a time when you had a catastrophic event that you had to go through and you didn't know that it was going to happen. Nobody told you. But then somehow when you were in it and you were walking through your suffering, you could look back and you could see slivers of moment when things were said. And you could see where you were prepared ahead of time to endure what you were facing. It makes a lot of sense why Jesus would tell them ahead of time what's going to happen. And even though they didn't get it then, they didn't have to get it then. Jesus was the only one who needed to get it then because he was the only one that was going to walk through it then. The rest of them would have to hear it then. And later on on the other side, they would remember what it was that they were told before it actually happened. And it would become a great comfort for them. If you look in John chapter 16, Jesus speaks of his departure and he talks about the reason that he has to go. 
more of the greater meaning behind what his suffering was going to be. He knew that that suffering would wipe away the veil, not only the veil in the temple of the Holy of Holies, that was a symbolic split of the veil in the, that, that was between and separated us from the Lord God himself. And he was going to take down that wall of partition. He was going to do away with the separation. There is nothing ever, ever to stop you in any moment in life to cry out to God and you will be heard. Because of the blood of Jesus that was shed at Calvary, he took away the wrath of God. His sacrifice was accepted as though you paid every bit of your sins, as though they had never happened. And he removed them into the sea of forgetfulness by forgiveness and remembering them no more. That remembering is not a literal remembering. It's just not bringing it up anymore. It's not an issue anymore. What the issue is, is that someone has paid the price. And what the issue is, is that we have to believe it. And if we believe it, we'll receive it. And when we walk in union and in communion and in fellowship with God, wonderful things happen. This is the thing that took place. And that was the greater meaning. And so let me go ahead and read this. It says, I have said all these things. Uh, John 16, verse 1. I have said all these things to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogue. See, I'm telling you ahead of time. This is what's going to happen. And I'm telling you so you won't, you won't be overcome. And the hour has come when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. That's what Saul did before he became Paul. He went, he went around and he had uh, Christians thrown in prison. And uh, they, they were known as people of the way. He was there at the stoning of Stephen, holding all the cloaks of the people and condoning that stoning. He was on a rampage to step out a heresy. Oh, it's no different today. There are people in churches today who think when they stamp out the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. They're doing God a service. There are people today who uh, write books and criticism of outpourings, even was done in the Brownsville revival, saying that was not a move of God. You know, it's, it still happens today. Somehow or another, people feel as though God puts a sword in their hand and he needs their help to stamp out heresies. Well, I, he hadn't hired me to do that. He's just hired me to teach truth. And so anyway, uh, called me to teach truth, not hired me, called me to do it. And I had to die to my old life to enter into this life. And, uh, and my goodness, what a, wonderful, what a wonderful death it was and a wonderful, wonderful life that it is. And he says, and they will do these things because they've not known the Father or me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. And then he goes on to say to them, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm getting ready to leave, he says. And then he says, because I've said these things to you, sorrows filled your heart. And then he goes on to say, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, verse 7, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. So here was more purpose in his death. Not only was it for the removal of our sins, for us to have a, a new heart, be born again, but it was also that the Holy Spirit would come and the Holy Spirit would live and help us and live inside us, fill us. But he, but, he, but he goes on to say, he says, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus says he's sending the Spirit. And when he comes, he'll convict the world of sin. He'll, concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He says concerning sin... Because they don't believe in me. So he's going to convict people. 
He's going to convict people how they're missing the mark because they don't even believe in God. And they don't even believe that God loved the world so much that, that he sent his own son to, to, to become an atoning sacrifice for, for us where, where we could enter into the glorious, eternal uh, relationship and communion with our creator, our God. Uh, that, was, that was his desire in the beginning before, uh, before, before we fell into sin. And so, and so then, then he says, and of righteousness and judgment. Uh, so he says, of righteousness, because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer. What he's saying is, is he says, you're going to be right with God because I'm going to go before the Father. I'm going to make intercession for you and, and, and prepare a place for you. And what, what I have done uh, by going away is I have made you right with God. You couldn't do it yourself. Wouldn't matter, you know, how many hungry mouths you feed or how hard you work or how strong or how weak or how caring or not caring or loving. None of that gets us in right standing with God. Jesus already did it. We don't have to redo what's already be, been done. It's our, it's our chore. It's our, it's our work to believe it, to receive it. And sometimes it gets clouded when we get into things that we know that don't please the Father. When we start violating our own personal values, it's very hard for us to believe that we have been made right with God by the cross. But you know, that's the only thing that can make you righteous before God is the blood of the Lamb and for you to believe it. And, you know, in any circumstance, some may say, well, I believed it one time. And, you know, I got born again and I got in the kingdom. But are you believing it in the circumstances that you're in now? Are you believing in this moment that that blood still says what it said 2,000 years ago? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That the meaning and the purpose of that cross is the same today as it was yesterday. And then he goes on to say, and, con and, and concerning Judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. It doesn't say the people of this world is judged. It says the ruler of this world is judged. There was some influence that was going on in that garden. There was somebody talking to some people that God had made and had loved. And they were influenced by that. And that one that was influencing them has been judged. That influence is here to this day. There are people who are being influenced in ways to do things that are detestable to themselves and to God. And yet they do it. And that God of this world, that influencer, has been judged. You haven't been judged. You've been saved. You've been delivered. You've been set free. All you have to do is believe it. God did it. He didn't come down here to condemn. He came down here because he loves. And he goes on to say in verse 12, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But he says, when the spirit of truth comes, there's another characteristic, a helper, spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. You know, this is something that was a key to the ministry of Jesus while he was here on this earth. He made it very clear that he wasn't speaking out of his own strength or out of his own thoughts or minds or ways, but that he was speaking as he heard the Father speak. And whatever he heard, that's what he would say. He says the Holy Spirit's going to do the same thing. The Spirit's not going to come down and operate on its own way, on his own way, but he's going to listen and hear, and what he hears he'll convey. You know, Jesus was tempted to get off track with that. I don't know if you remember or not, but I certainly remember reading about when the devil told him to turn rocks into bread. And, you know, he had the power to do it. He's the son of God. Not only could he turn rocks into bread, but he's the one that created the rocks. And uh, he certainly could have done that. But he was not commanded to do that by his father. And he was here to operate out of what his father said. There was another influence that was there trying to influence him. Oh, you see it permeating throughout his life. 
What were they saying to him when he was on the cross? If you really are the son of God, come down off that cross. They were taunting him even in that place, trying to get him to operate in his own deity rather than as a human being uh, taking obedience, being obedient to the father. And that's what he was. And he would only speak that which his father would, would, would he would hear. And then he says the spirit will do the same thing. He says he will speak and declare to you the things that are to come. Huh. And verse 14, he will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And all that the father has in mind. And he will take what is, is mine. And, he's, he, and, and I said, he will take what is mine, declare it to you. So he's going to declare what Jesus is saying to declare. And uh, so here, you know, uh, over and over again, he's telling them the future. In a little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while you will see me. And so then some of the disciples said to one another, you know, what is it that he's saying? A little while, you'll, you'll not see me again. A little while, you will, because I'm going to the Father. And so they were saying, what does that mean? What does that a little while mean? What is that? And Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him. And so he said, is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while, you will see, not see me again? A little while, you will. Truly I say to me, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, now once again, Jesus is speaking of this traumatic time, this time that's coming upon them where he will be drugged through the streets, he will be publicly shamed and humiliated, and he will be publicly crucified on display. And he's speaking of greater meaning. And he says, this is like when a woman is given birth. She has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. See, when a woman is pregnant, she knows that her anguish and her suffering and her struggles there's a, greater, there's a greater meaning to that. It's something that she walks through. So it gives birth to something greater. And you know how mothers are. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, you might, you, might, you might mess with them and get away with it. But don't you touch their babies. Oh, no. No. And so here, here, we, here, we, here, here we have and, and, and also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. And, and, you know, he just goes on and on with these sayings. Verse 25, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I'll no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I'll tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say that you will ask the Father on your behalf, that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you've loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and I've come into the world and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. And then the disciples said, Aha, now you're speaking plainly. And not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things. And do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And he continues on with them. Okay, so you believe. But he says the hour is coming when you're going to be scattered. And he says you'll abandon me. You'll leave me alone. It was hard for them to hear those things. He says, I've said these things that you may have peace in the world. You'll have tribulation, but take heart. I've overcome the world. So see, he's speaking of all these things in advance. And he's saying, it's just labor, labor. 
You know, Paul said something like that. He said, when you, when you begin to hear of wars, the rumors of wars, things are happening, that those are the birthing pains of the birthing in of the kingdom of God. There's a lot of pain in this world. There's a lot of people who are suffering. And some people are not suffering physically, but they're suffering inwardly for no reason, no rational reason. They're experiencing emotional turmoil. And, you know, these are signs of pregnancy. This world is pregnant with the kingdom of God and will break forth and bring forth his kingdom. And it is truly on the way. You know, I know that uh, when I talk about these things, to some of you, it's like yes and amen. It's, it's just hammering right into where you are. And others, well, it, it may not be so clear. Uh, how can the things that the world's going through now, how can there be any greater meaning in suffering? What good can come out of all this Nazareth and all of these kinds of things that are happening? You know, I don't, I, I, I don't imagine we think very much uh, these days because you see so many of them. But you know that thing that people wear around their neck called a cross? And there's gold crosses and there's silver crosses. You know, people didn't wear crosses like that before Christ was crucified. That, that was an emblem of shame. Be like wearing a skull, you know, a skeleton, bones. The cross doesn't have shame anymore. It removes shame. There was greater meaning to come on the other side. But the cross wasn't just to remove the shame from the one who was on the cross. The cross was for the one to bear the shame of those of us who were not on the cross. And we can wear an object of shame around our necks, wear it as beautiful jewelry, and it has no ugly death meaning any longer. And so it is with people who come into that personal knowledge with Jesus Christ. Our God is the only God that can literally wipe away shame and wipe away guilt from the human soul. Shame is something that can be very devastating and isolating. It is something that we experience, maybe not because so much of what we've done, but because of what we experienced and what others have done to us and around us can make us feel dirty and unclean, undesirable, unwanted. And what Jesus did is he bore all of that and can wash it away instantly. It happens fast. Salvation happens quick. All you have to do is call on the name of the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ, as your personal Lord and Savior, this is a great opportunity for you to come to meet him tonight. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, whosoever, that is everybody. There's whosoever's everywhere. And if any one of the whosoever's in this world well, just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, help me. Jesus, save me. Whoever, Jesus, heal me. Jesus, deliver me. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Greek word for that is so-so, S-O-Z-O. And it means, it means delivered. It means healed. It, 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 it's an encompassing word. It means salvation, and, uh, and, and, and it's yours for the asking. Pray this prayer with me if this is speaking to you tonight. Whether you need healing tonight, whether you need deliverance tonight, whether you need salvation tonight, just say, Lord Jesus, 
I call upon your name right now. There's no other God but you. And I ask you to come into my heart and save me. Come into my life and deliver me. Come into my body and heal me. Fill me with your spirit, I pray. Amen and amen. I tell you, there's a glorious presence that is here right now. And I really believe that those of you who are listening right now are experiencing the presence of the Almighty God. Such a peaceful, peaceful presence. I want to pray in the midst of this presence right now for you, for your families, for your children. I know many of you parents are very concerned about your children, the circumstances in schools and things that are going on there. Some of you who are listening are school teachers, and I know the struggles that you're having. I've heard you can't even hardly get substitutes to come in. If a teacher isn't able to show up, classes have to be combined. There's a lot of turmoil, a lot of things that are happening. But let me ask you this question. Is there any good thing that can come out of all this? Is there a Savior? Are there people who are turning to God because they're facing things that are beyond their ability to change and to grasp? And I really believe that in the midst of all of this, there are heroes and there are people who are surrendering. There are people who are turning to the God and saying, you know, Lord, life itself, life itself is so precious. And I want to, to, to uh, bless you tonight. And I want to pray for you tonight that God will bless you. And Father, I just extend my hand towards each and every person right now under the sound of my voice. And I just pray, God, where there needs to be healing, healing will come. Where there needs to be miracles, miracles will come. That you will pour out your spirit upon them because they are flesh. And you said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Let your spirit pour right now and just fill their hearts. There may be some who are empty on the inside right now. Maybe because they've lost loved ones. I ask you, God, to heal their emptiness. I ask you, Lord, to touch them and fill them with love and, and connection with you that they're not alone and not abandoned. And I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, I trust that the blessing of Abraham will come upon you. Oh, and he'll make you the head and not the tail. And you'll be the lender and not the borrower. And your children will be taught by the Lord. And great shall be their peace. They'll walk in divine favor. And they'll have favor from those who are in authority over their lives. And I pray God will be with you going in. His Spirit will overshadow you. And He will bless you all the days of your life and beyond. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for coming tonight, being here. I love being with you. And I'll be looking forward to seeing you again in the near future.